Hey, good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to call the regular meeting of the Common Council of the City of Platteville to order. It's Tuesday, August 10th, 2021. It's 7 p.m. and we are in the council chambers in the city. Uh, Candace, we'll start with uh, roll call. Kathy Kopp. Here. Jason Arts. Here. Isaac Shanley. Here. Eileen Nichols. Here. Barbara Doss. Here. Ken Killian. Here. And the first order of business is to administer the oath of office and make appointments to boards and commissions of our new at-large alder person. So Candace and Lynn. the microphone here because um, I'll just have you repeat after me Read. state of Wisconsin Grant County I state your name Lynn Parrott and then just say have been elected or appointed to the alder person at large have been elected but have not yet entered upon the duties thereof but have not yet entered upon the duties thereof. Swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And will faithfully discharge the duties of said office to the best of my ability, so help me God. And will faithfully discharge the duties of Currently, Lynn is signing her uh, official, oath. official oath. And as she does that, uh, uh, she is also being then appointed to the Freudenreich Animal Care Advisory Committee, uh, the Platteville Public Library Board, our Public Transportation Committee, and our Solid Waste and Recycling Task Force. And prior, and not part of this appointment, but of an earlier appointment, she's on our Tide Committee. So uh, Lynn, I know that you have family in the audience tonight. Would you like to point them out? And uh... Well, I am excited that my mom drove all the way here prior to the storm happening in Chicago. Um, my dad is here. Um, it means so much to me that they are supporting me. I have my friends and family here from Black Platte. My grandbaby is here who is going to be a politician one day. <laughs> and my goddaughter Latanya is here. And I'm just really excited um, about being able to step forward and represent and do the right thing, do what I feel is the right thing. Oh, and I'm sitting right next to Ken, <laughs> my buddy. Good. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Okay, moving on then in our uh, agenda, we have the consideration of the consent calendar. The following <coughs> items may be approved on a single motion or vote due to their routine natures or previous discussion. If you would like uh, separate discussion on any of these items, please let me know and we can uh, uh, pull it from the consent uh, calendar and then uh, discuss it. Uh, in the packet were our council minutes from July 27th. We have our bills to be paid, the financial report for July, appointments to boards and commissions. The only ones that were to be made tonight have been made, and those are lent to the committees as were uh, noted. Licenses, we have a Class B combination beer and liquor license uh, to Seven Hills Brewing Company uh, from Dubuque for the premises as, at 92 East Main Street. We have one and two year operator licenses to serve and sell and serve alcohol as outlined in your packet and street closing permits, Hickory Street between Pine and Greenwood Streets for the St. Augie's annual Welcome Week block party, which would be Wednesday, September 1st from 2 to 8 p.m. And then for Highbury Circle, beginning at, south bound, at the south boundary 
of 975 Highbury Circle for a wedding reception on Saturday, September 25th from 9 to midnight, and then a banner permit for Dairy Days uh, to hang above uh, Water Street August 11th through September 11th. I move to approve the consent calendar. I'll second. So we have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. Candace will vote. Cop? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Shanley? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, citizens' comments, observations, and petitions, if any. I have no. Uh, persons uh, who have registered to speak during this time. Uh, for anyone new in the council chambers, there is a green sheet that's in the back of the room if, uh, that needs to be completed if you wish to speak during a council meeting. So I, I think those instructions are back there also. Uh, reports that were in the packet. Uh, the Freudenreich Animal Care Advisory Committee report um that would have been robin's committee anybody see anything there they wanted to mention okay parks forestry and recreation jason i want to say we're like at full committee if not um pretty close so that's exciting but yeah great <laughs> all right uh community safe routes committee jason uh nothing to add okay the housing authority board ken no addition other reports that were in your packet were the water and sewer financial report for July, the airport financial report, uh, the task force on uh, inclusivity, diversity, and equity update. Anybody have anything? Adam, did you want to add anything there, anything? No. Okay. And then department progress reports. Uh, the other thing that I would mention at this point in time is that in today's shopping news, uh, you would have received your 53818 update for the fall. Uh, I borrowed this one from Jody. Jody, I got the paper as I left home, so I can't say that I've read it, but uh, I would just point out to people that this is in the shopping news, uh, distributed through the shopping news, and it is in your mail today. All right, we'll move on then to our action item request to amend the historic designation at 130 Market Street. Joe. Yes, the, uh, the property owners, uh, or the owners of the property at 130 Market Street have uh, submitted a letter to the city uh, requesting that their property be removed from the downtown commercial historic district. Um, there's a process that's outlined in uh, chapter 27, which is the uh, historic preservation uh, ordinance that uh, does outline this type of a procedure. Basically, they submit the letter that they've done. Uh, this request goes to the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, they're required to hold a public hearing and consider that request, which they had have done already on uh, July 20th. Um, and then the commission makes a recommendation to the council and the council makes the, the final decision. Um, so as I mentioned, the commission did hold a public hearing on, on July 20th. Um, the applicants uh, spoke at that meeting, but there were uh, no members from the public that spoke. Uh, the commission did discuss the matter. Um, they recommended denial of this request. Um, uh, staff, uh, we had three members of the staff that were also at that meeting in the public hearing, and um, it's our opinion that there was no information presented at that public hearing that really indicated why this property should be treated differently than the other properties in the district. Um, so our recommendation is also for denial. Any questions? Any questions of Joe? <coughs> Questions of Joe. Uh, I have had uh, one person request to speak in favor of this removal, and so I would ask Jeff Haas to come to the microphone. Well, I'm Jeff Haas. Um, I live at 755 Grand Street, Platteville. I'm one of the owners of that property. Lisa's my wife, and. We own the businesses of Barbershop Rock and uh, the Easy 50-50. So this evening I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to express our reasoning for requesting to be released from the Platteville Main Street Commercial Historic District. We purchased the building 
130 Market Street in 2014. Since that time, we have built two successful businesses in the building and are poised to continue to grow. We managed to make it through the very trying time for all businesses and hope to continue to be successful for many years. We love our community and love being able to create businesses that draw people to our community. Our experience with being in the historic district has been less than ideal. Anything that we consider doing to the exterior of the building that requires a permit has to be approved by the HPC. This includes such things that are required when converting a building from a residential use to commercial use. In the past, we tried to find historical information pertaining to the use of the building. We have heard the rumored uses, however, we could not find any evidence of past commercial use that would grandfather the building as far as commercial building codes related to safety and ADA compliance. So when creating the downstairs barbershop and later the upstairs speakeasy 5050 lounge, we were required to obtain state approved plans under the current building codes. This is especially problematic when going in front of the HPC when we are trying to make legal changes to a building and people are providing their personal viewpoint on what they believe would look right. This is a house that has been converted into a commercial property. It is a property is, that is being repurposed. It is no longer a residential building. Lisa's vision and drive had resulted in her winning the Weedick Best Interior Renovation over 50,000 for her renovation of the interior of the building at 130 Market Street when we did the barbershop rock. With this vision, business planning and drive, her experience going through the process with the HPC has resulted in unneeded frustration, stress, expenditures, and delays. From the very start of our experience with the HPC, Mr. Prohaska has expressed to us the availability of tax credits, much like he did at the last meeting, and how much we could save on our projects. We have looked into that in the past and have looked into it again recently. What he is not telling you is that there is another application process, plan approval process, building expenses that have to be funded to the end of the project and when the project, once completed, has, has to be certified before you can get your reimbursement. Now, looking at the federal criteria for these programs, you have to consider who is making your plans. You will have to find an architect that is well-versed in historic buildings. You either have to find a contractor that is well-versed in historic re reconstruction or oversee the program yourself so closely that it, if a mistake is made, you don't lose out on your reimbursement. Now, from the information I saw as recently as last week, or this week actually, only 20% is reimbursable through the state program and 20% through the federal program. So, to take advantage of 40%, you would have to do this process times two to include potential delays or risk of not being approved. Is it worth it? For a small business owner that has to obtain a building loan and extend themselves to create something usable, no, absolutely not. This has been the only potential benefit we have been told about related to being in the historic district. We ask you what you believe is a benefit to having the building in the historic district. What has been provided because of it? What improvements have been paid for by grants or funding related to this historic district? I can tell you that the HPC stifles growth. They diminish creative drive. The HPC approval process creates an environment of do and ask for forgiveness rather than seek approval. This has no more apparent, this was no more apparent to us than when we went through the process to get approval for our front sign for Barbershop Rock. The sign company did a fantastic job creating visuals for the meeting, we reviewed the guidelines, and met the, them appropriately. What we ran into at the meeting was disgusting. A group where some members came in late, unprepared, only opening their packet at the meeting table itself. Then I sat there as every other possible location for the sign was suggested, including locations that were safety issues and others that were outside of their own guidelines. One person expressed how they did not want the building to look like it had a zit on it. Another member had ripped the picture out of the, out of the photo of the sign and building and was moving around on the photograph of the building. 
Ultimately, they expressed that they were not going to approve it, and we went in front of the council to appeal the decision. That was the second time that we had to appeal the decision. One of the last times we went to the HPC was for approval on a project item. A member contacted our architect asking questions and requesting things that resulted in us being charged an additional money. That was addressed by, with the member by, the, by staff. However, however, we still had to pay for that. Our recent experience with the process, this asking to be released from the district, we had prepared for a meeting and were trying to attend when we were informed that there were not enough members available to hold the meeting. The meeting was then rescheduled and we had to change our plans to attend. At the meeting, the only discussion was that of Mr. Prohaska reading the same speech he did for you last council meeting. No one asked significant questions. No one explained what the benefits of, to being in the district were. No one said anything about why it is so important that we even have a historic district. They all voted unanimous, unanimously excuse me, to decline it. At the last council meeting, it was my mistake for not putting a request in to speak about why we wanted out, but I was also concerned that there was no discussion. I can tell you that only recently have I been fully involved in the building processes and creative planning of the, build, of the businesses. This is because of my full-time job that I just retired from last year. I can tell you that Lisa did a remarkable job creating the businesses of Barbershop Rock and Speakeasy 50-50. Some of you have been inside our business as others have not. I encourage you to see what is bringing people to us and to our community. <coughs> as you can see from what is provided in the packet, there is not much information that mandates that we must stay in the historic district. There is no significant historic relevance of the building for Platteville. The only reason it is in the historic registry is that it has cement brick material and some other architectural components. Please discuss what the benefits for our community have having these districts, historic districts, and having already struggling biz small businesses within them. Perhaps this is not just a question for us getting out of the historic district, but that of getting rid of the district altogether. You can bet if it doesn't work for our successful business that it may not fit up for others either. Through our discussions with other members of the historic district, regardless of how you vote tonight, we do know that unless there is an improvement in how things are done with the historic district, that others will be demanding change. Not one business wants to make things undesirable to visitors of our community. Rather, they want it to do things that improve their, bu their buildings, their business, and the community they live in. They want to spend their money their way without having to go through an antiquated process and face personal opinions of people that have no financial interest in their property. Thank you. I also have in front of me a, um, someone who is registering in favor but is not here to speak and that would be Jim, Sch Jim Schneller is registering in favor of this removal. So now it's time for council discussion. Questions, comments? I have a question, and maybe Joe can handle this. <clears throat> so I see that nobody from the Historic Society, our commission is here. So one thing that's in our packet, it states that this property is considered a contributing property within the district. Can you explain that to me, and why it is? Uh, that, well, that was a designation that was uh, put on that property when the district was created, so that was before my time here, but um, when they set up the district, they had a historic preservation consultant that did a survey of the, the buildings uh, in the community, and based on their uh, opinion of the properties and the condition of those properties at that time, they made a determination of which properties were contributing and which properties were non-contributing. So basically the uh, non-contributing properties had physical characteristics that it was altered beyond what it was originally constructed as, so it no longer had the characteristics that would be deemed um, historic. Uh, so the properties that uh, were contributing still had the physical characteristics that were 
uh, primarily present when the building was constructed. So it was, you know, considered a, an important part of the district when it was created. It's not as for a financial contribution or a draw, bring people into town because of that building. It's just for the fact that it was, the exterior was somewhat similar to what it was originally constructed. Correct. So that's the definition of a contributing property. It would be something that hasn't been physically altered from its historic look. Right, and, and obviously the, the, the buildings that would be considered for including in a district to begin with would have to have a historic value um, to warrant even considering a district. And we know what that historic value of this building is? <laughs> um, not specific to this building. I mean, I just included in the packet the uh, uh, the paperwork for the, the district itself and just uh, the, the one summary sheet for that property just so everybody knew what the property looked like more than anything. Um, but they did identify some additional uh, physical characteristics that were um, common to that uh, style of building of that age. Um, so it's a um, so physical characteristics were determined to be um, a good example of that style of building. And since it was intact, um, it was considered a, a contributing building for that district. Because what I see and being in the building as well, and from going by it, other than somewhat looking like it did when it was originally built, the property probably contains no um, other indications that, of what it was when it was historic. It's, it's a two commercials two commercial properties now instead of a single residence. Um, the appearance side, although somewhat structurally has stayed the same, the appearance itself has changed. Um, the appearance of the interior has changed. The floor plan of the property itself on the grounds has changed from parking to concrete, et cetera. So, um, so that's what that building. And as owning a building, main, <coughs> excuse me, on Main Street in the past, you know, I can see where Mr. Hawes' frustration comes with the Historic Preservation Commission on want to do anything on the outside, um, anything on your building or your site as well. So, um, you know, based on my, my experience as Jeff and many other people, you know, I do agree with Jeff, whether this gets taken out or not, there should be some, I think there needs to be some, quite a few changes made to that commission on how the determining factors of what can be done to one's property or not and what say they have. So, um, not only for a financial point, like Jeff has stated, but um, you know, a timely matter. And in cases like this, when he's trying to run a couple of businesses, you know, everybody knows time is money. So when he's sitting there trying to get something done and all of a sudden he's waiting on three, four months on a decision that should have been made in two to three weeks or even a month, um, you know, something needs to be changed there. But we'll go back to this building here. Um, I haven't seen anything in this packet here. What I've looked, what I've heard, um, you know, the, just in my opinion here that warrants keeping this property in this district when the owners themselves you know that actually pay the taxes on the property, have maintained it, want to make changes to it to bring more people downtown, more business in town. I haven't seen, I haven't seen one indication that uh, warrants keeping this into the, the um, historic district as it's designated. So I'd be in favor of removing it. Others? I just want to say that I appreciate the additional information provided by Mr. Haas and I thought that was very helpful. Um, one question I have is, um, it was mentioned that there was no record of it being a commercial property or there was some confusion. Is that kind of what is is an issue at hand too? Like there's no documentation in terms of it being prior like commercial versus a residential? Uh, well, that, that's, uh, that was an issue when they tried to convert the building from residential to commercial. So uh, when they did that, triggered a different set of building codes. Um, instead of one or two family dwelling, it went to a commercial building code. So the state has a uh, provision that they do take into consideration um, the past history of the building. If you can show that at some point in the past it was considered um, commercial, that's theoretically the building codes that were in place at that particular time would still apply. Um, this building was never used commercial prior to that, so there was no record of that. So uh, the property, the current property owners are the ones that converted from residential to commercial. Okay. And so that needed to be, that had to have state approval to convert from, resi or from residential to commercial? 
Yeah, but that yeah. that has nothing to do with its location in the historic district. Okay. A okay. Any property anywhere in the state of Wisconsin that is converted from residential to commercial has to go through that process. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. But, so you're telling me there wasn't a di that it would it wouldn't have mattered if it was in the historic district or not in the historic district, the same building codes would have applied. Correct. So converting, so it had nothing to do with the fact that it was in the historic district that they had to go for state approval. If, the, if it had been at any other location in town, that Correct. would have also been the thing. Right, the, the, the only thing different would have, would have been the- residential to commercial. Right, the only thing that would have different is the involvement of the review by the Historic Preservation Commission. But, but they don't the, the review the- building codes the, would have been- They don't review the building codes. Correct. So the building code issues would be because it was going to commercial use. They didn't have anything to do with the Historic Preservation Commission. Correct. So if there were delays of two or three weeks in building plans, that could have easily been because it was at the state level, not at the local level. Right. I mean, you're not going to get a state approved plans for any commercial project that quick anywhere. So. It's a delayed process. That's just how that process works. Yeah, I heard today that it's uh, it's like a three to four month backlog right now for state approved plans for commercial buildings. Okay. So. I think we're discussing two different things though. So I understand the state approved building plans, but then also when it comes to the historic preservation side of your area, not only not just the plans, but the materials that could be used, the the aesthetics the looks that's what the delay is so they get to approve or not approve what can be used on certain things to make the property look that way so it has nothing to do with commercial with the building codes i'm sorry if i stated that oh um, yeah no. but i'm talking about what they you know they can sit there and say well i'm sorry this uh, use an example um sorry this exterior door does we do not feel meets what would have been done at that time or when it was built you know so they can sit there and delay or make recommendations something else and that's that's the point I was trying to get at there. And for clarification, that is that type of stuff that you're talking about is done by the historic preservation, or is that by the state as well? Like they can come in and like set, like do some of the historical requirements as well. State part that, geez, I'm not sure on that part, but okay. I'm, I'm pretty much thinking the historical. I mean, the, area. The, the state is going to be looking to make sure it meets the requirements of the building code. Okay, so they have nothing to do with the historic. Right, part but they, okay. they, the, the state may. In this particular property, the state building codes did dictate um, exterior building changes because when they uh, converted to commercial, they had uh, you know existing windows uh, on the exterior. You can't even see them from the street, but between those buildings, since those buildings are so close together, uh, the state required a, a fire barrier to be installed in those buildings. Okay. So that was a... a an exterior change that was required, but it was not because of the district, it was because okay. of the commercial building code. All right, thanks for that clarification. Um, and the other thing is too, I agree with um, Council Person Shanley in terms of if we could potentially have a review of the processes or, or just kind of the, um, the function um, of the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, you know, maybe it sounds like currently I'm not hearing that there's any like financial or any other benefit of being in the district, um, but you know maybe maybe there could be re revisions or or maybe the process can be looked at and see if you know maybe there are in the future there might be some some benefit or or not. Um, so I would agree if we could have a, a review of that that would be that would be helpful as well. I, I just had a question that hit along with what you were saying about the benefits, um, but I'm. Wanted to direct it to Mr. Haas? I, or do I direct the question? You, you direct. See, okay. So here's my question. Um, when he purchased the building in 2014, did he purchase it agreeing that he would continue to hold it as a historical building? And if, if he did, did he feel like now, because what I'm, what I'm getting is that on their end, they're not holding up whatever he needs to move forward. So was, is that something that was assumed? Was it something when you purchased it that you have to hold it as a historic building? And is that the, another issue that we're gonna have to deal with? Joe yes. 
Um, I'm going to ask you first. Uh, the historic districts are labeled, so when people purchase property, would they know if a property is in the historic district? Well, I mean, it's public record. It, we've got uh, maps of it. Um, obviously, it's on the state register, uh, national register. Um, when it's marketed, I, I don't know what kind of uh, information the, the uh, current property owner at that point or the realtor you know, provides to uh, buyers. But, I mean, it's, it's information that's readily available, the location of the district. So I guess, um, Jeff, could you come back? And I, I, the, there's one question. The question is, when you purchased the property, did you know it was in the historic district? Honestly, uh, I, I don't recall it being an issue when we no. purchased the property. So you don't recall talking about it? No. No. no I, Eileen, Eileen was involved with that purchase. She was uh, the seller to us, uh, or the real estate agent with us that sold us the property. Yeah, at the time, Jeff, you, I don't think you had your plans for a barbershop rock or a commercial a business Well, we had upstairs. the plans because we had to change had, the zoning. It, yeah, it was, but you purchased um, it knowing it was a residential property in a history. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, we knew it was a uh, residential building, and we had to get it rezoned. That's for sure. So I, I'm sure that pro pro probably came up. We didn't think that that was going to be that much of an issue, but uh, that, as you can okay. see, we've, we've had a, our share of issues. Uh, Joe, can you also clarify, um, Historic Preservation Commission, uh, do they approve interior or exterior? Exterior changes only. Exterior changes only. Correct. Okay. Okay. So Other further clarification, that means basically they can do whatever they want in the interior and it doesn't have to go through an approval process or how does that work? Uh, yeah, the interior would be just building code, any building code items, um, but no uh, approvals. So the, uh, the approvals we're talking about are to the exterior only. And, in, and building code things were, I mean, that's separate from historic preservation or historic designation. So if I have a problem with building codes because I want to put in X, Y, or Z, that's something that's state building code, and that's what I have to deal with. Correct. So if they say you have to have this door or that window or you can't use that ceiling or you need to do this bathroom or you need to do that water line, then that's what I have to do because it's state building code. Correct. Abby? Um, got a question of Jeff, but... Um, we heard at our last meeting that it's a significant process. Um, Gary Prohaska made that presentation about what it would take for a property to be removed. So, Joe, do you want to speak to that? Uh, well, what I think um, Gary was referring to is most of the uh, uh, communities that do have that um, Provision in the ordinance have uh, specific criteria that need to be met in order for that process to uh, be approved. Um, that would be a, uh, an item that is at Chapter 27. We need to take that into consideration. Uh, our ordinance should be modified to allow that. Um, but I believe that's basically what he's talking about. Is there there should be a, you know an outlined, which I alluded to in, in you know part of the reason for the staff report is you know. There should be an indication of why a particular property is different compared to all the other properties in the district. You know, these are the particular criteria. The property should meet these criteria, whatever special circumstances are present in order for that uh, approval to be granted. That's summarizing what I recall Gary talking about, but that's how, what I took away from it. But as of today's date, is there anything on our books? Like is for that? I, I explained the process when I started. That that, that is the process in, okay. in our ordinance. Our process is a public hearing. All right. PS. Okay. So uh, there are two members on the calendar. At least I believe there are two people here who were when these properties, when these historic districts were created. Were you on council when the? And I know Ken was. 
I was not on the council when the historic districts were created. So Ken, what, do you have anything that you would like to weigh in and say? No, I prefer to not make an addition to this. Uh, it was created, what, back in the 90s, and uh, there were properties, as Joe said, that were s selected and met enough of the criteria as far as being historic. And this building yet at 130 Market still retains enough of the historic character of the exterior so that it um, is a property that the commission decided to deny as far as uh, removal from the district. And this, this was done, as you may recall, by contacting many of the people that work with historic districts, uh, outside persons, so that we're not just talking only from the local district as far as what we think about it, but we asked for other people to give us input on what we should be doing with this situation. This is the first time we have encountered this. And again, I want to go along with Joe in saying that this is working on the exterior of the property and not the interior of the property. I have anything to add to what Ken said. I remember the process and that um, there were properties downtown that were excluded because they did not meet historic um, designation requirements and this house did, so it was included. Kathy? Um, Given this, um, the comments by Jeff, and um, I'm, I'm in agreement that I would like to do a review of how the historic preservation makes their decisions, um, because I'm wondering if part of the frustration, and this goes back to my years prior of, of having some businesses very frustrated with it took to get approvals for um, sign a new window door exhaust system or whatever so um, my question is um, not knowing your time frame of when you want to move forward could this issue be tabled until we review that I feel that we owe it to really kind of look to see if this is possibly a stumbling block for um, others as well. Are you making a motion to table? I will make a motion to table based okay. on a review of the process with um, of the historic preservation. Okay. okay. Motions to table don't need sec. They do need sec. <laughs> I have to look at my Robert. Do I have a second for a motion to table? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to table this motion. Uh, Candace will vote. Cop? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Shanley? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. There was nothing in the motion as far as a timeline, as far as how much time it'll take to, to study this. Joe will bring us back that information. Is it too late to add um, if you could find any information or any other feedback from um, businesses in the district as well that may have um, some issues with the process? So if you have, if you have things that you specifically want uh, included or suggestions, please forward them to Adam, who will then accumulate them and uh, talk with uh, Joe about those. And uh, in the meantime, uh, Adam, I would ask that, I don't believe the whole, maybe the whole thing was in here. No. Are any ordinance that we have or anything that deals with historic preservation and the uh, uh, charge or mission or mm -hmm. whatever for the historic preservation, Commission, please uh, provide that to all council members. All right. Uh, that's, that was the only action item on our agenda. So now we will move on to information and discussion items. 
The first one of this is ordinance, uh, the ordinance amending section 3606 of the municipal code pertaining to alcohol licenses. And I believe, Candace, this is yours. Yes. So essentially, the ordinance um, has been prepared, the ordinance um, amendment, I guess, has been prepared by attorney um, Bill Cole, our city attorney. And it is to reflect the statute change that now allows um, establishments that hold a Class B license to serve liquor um, the opportunity to essentially sell a mixed drink so long as there is a seal over top of it and they can for the for example sell something that is um, like vodka and sprite I don't know <laughs> as long as there is some sort of seal and they can walk out of the establishment with it but it's not an open container so this is something that um, is a state law and we are just now reflecting our ordinance to um, be in compliance with that state law. Okay, questions of Candace. So I believe this law was adopted early. This year. Early mm. this year, could you, 2020. Could you explain what a tamper-proof container would be for carry-on? Did he define that for you? <laughs> Uh, that's a very good question because um, it has not actually been defined. Um, the DOR is actually uh, working on this. The Department of Revenue is working on, I think, getting that more defined. They're even finding when they send their agents out to various establishments that there's different interpretations by establishments on what um, sealed means. Um, but I, I do believe that it has to be something that essentially shows that you're not supposed to be just opening this and consuming it um, as you're you know, driving down the road or walking away from the business, that it's something that is definitely like a barrier, such as you know, um, a wine bottle would be sealed or a bottle of beer would be sealed with a cap. Well, I've been thinking about this and uh, to me a seal would be something like, for example, a prescription bottle. Some bottles have a seal on them, so you have to break that seal to open it up. So it seems to me there has to be a, a method to have a seal that has to be broken so that a person that takes out the bottle could give it to another one and say, this is a sealed bottle. So I, when I looked up tamper-proof, that's one way to look at it, but that's to me not enough to say it's not, it's tamper proof, but that doesn't really say it's a seal. You but are then they put correct. the words in tamper proof seal and I'm trying to find out what a tamper proof seal is. So apparently they have not solved that yet. They have not. They've definitely left it a little bit open on that end which, like I said, even when the Department of Revenue agents went out to various establishments, they were finding people interpreting it differently. Yeah. Well, as it states right now, I couldn't vote for this because it's really not defined well. That's, those are my comments. Okay, anybody else have questions of Candace? Otherwise, I have one person who's asked to speak about this. Anybody else? Jeff? Just uh, up here to mark my approval or in favor of uh, making it match the state statute um, to answer. I mean, something that we did was we did our research because we're a cocktail lounge and this is something that with music in the park, we can take advantage of this and maybe sell some drinks to people that want to go down and enjoy the music. So uh, the the tape that is out there that you can purchase, there's uh, it might be a little bit pricey right now because it's in demand, but uh, it actually, if you have plastic cups with a lid, um, the tape will go over the top, much like evidence tape. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if, if somebody punctures a straw through it, it's tamper evident. 
that it, it doesn't re the tape doesn't reseal itself. If the top is opened up, it, it's sticky enough that it sticks to that plastic and doesn't allow you to peel it back. So it's evident that that product was gotten into. So like the pill bottle, you can tell when somebody's gotten into that product. Um, so that's, that's what tam tamper evident kind of means. I don't know what the DOR, how they're gonna define it, but that's what we're looking at when we're purchasing things to be able to sell those products. Um, the other thing that I wanted to address with this change in the ordinance is that's not the only change that there, there's a portion in the ordinance that says uh, about intoxicating liquor that the class B license is also, also authorizes the sale of intoxicating liquor in the original package or container and the actual statute um, reads in any quantity, not four liters. So the statute actually changed probably two years ago, but it wasn't a big change, so nobody took notice of it. This is a big change, <laughs> obviously, but I think that that should be included to reflect the current statute. So that's why. Interesting. Uh, Candace, you want to talk to Attorney Cole about that change? I certainly can. Um, we do have the ability to make it more restrictive, so if we did want to keep it at four liters, we certainly could. Uh, but yeah, that's definitely something that I can speak with him about. Okay, any other questions about uh, this ordinance amendment that is really coming to us uh, by virtue of a change in Chapter 125 of the statutes of Wisconsin? Okay, then, folks, that one we will move to action uh, for our next meeting. Uh, next on our agenda, we have uh, the Platteville Community Arboretum uh, City um, Working Agreement. Howard. Yes, thank you very much. Um, the PCA, Platteville Community Arboretum, and its partners uh, worked very diligently to fundraise for the David Canning Roundtree Branch Trail in 2014. There were some uh, spoken agreements at the time regarding uh, trail maintenance. We're going, we're trying to document this right now. Um, I had proposed the enclosed um, uh, agreement, gave it to members of the PCA. They came back with some suggested comments most of them I uh, agreed with. Uh, there were two that I did not agree with, um, and those are in the package. Uh, if you have color, it would be in green. Um, um, but the first one um, that the PCA is recommending is the city is committed to seal the entire trail once every five years and appreciates the fi maintenance financial support the PCA provides that few other nonprofits do. Said sealing may be done in segments. Um, other than the uh, self-aggrandizement, uh, the big thing is the um, is committing to seal the trail every five years. I don't think that that's in the city's best interest to, to make a written commitment of that kind. Um, for example, um, uh, this year when we did the sealing on the trail, um, we had two quotes, one at 15 cents a square foot, the other at 20 cents a square foot. Uh, obviously we took the 15 cents a square foot, but looking at the size of the trail, if we were to do this, um, the cost of the ceiling would have to be no more than 16.7 cents a square foot, or else we wouldn't be able to do it within the budgets that are established. So if that were the case, then that would mean that the city is committing to paying more than its share in order to make the ceiling happen in a five-year period. I don't think that that's what we want to commit ourselves to do. Um, the second one is uh, 
uh, a comment regarding uh, as deemed appropriate to protect the $1.67 million trail investment. Uh, I think that's kind of superfluous. Um, I understand that, that they are very proud of the fact that they raised uh, that money through grants and local participation. Um, but I just don't know that that's uh, germane to what we have in here. Um, the, the paragraph is regarding uh, inspections of the stream bank. Um, and so it talks about uh, we will uh, do periodic inspections. Uh, we will, as appropriate, we will request uh, DNR grants to help cover costs for stream bank repairs. Um, and then it, it says if the DNR grant is not approved, the city may fund uh, at 100% sub funding subject to approval of the council and is not guaranteed. Uh, they wanted to include that additional language. Uh, I, I don't know that it's really necessary. But most of it is, uh, has been agreed to by both parties. So um, other than uh, those two areas that I've highlighted, um, I would recommend approval of the agreement. Okay, questions of Howard about this working agreement with PCA and the city as it relates to the David Candy, Candy Roundtree Branch Trail, which starts um, at um, the roundabout on Marquis? Yes. Um, on County there, D? Yes. It, and extends to the county line? Um, our portion of the trail only extends to um, the um, bridge next to the gazebo that's out behind Walmart. There's, um, there's the gazebo and the bridge, right. but we also own the trail that goes up the switchback uh, to behind Menards and Walmart, and, and then subsequently between Walmart and Menards. So that, does this apply to all that? Yes. Okay. Okay, so we're talking about a trail that starts between Menards and Walmart, goes north, down the hill, and then comes back toward town and concludes uh, under the uh, under Chestnut the, Street Bridge. Under the roundabout. Okay. Questions, comments? Kathy? Um, Howard, um, where did the five year? come from? I mean, to, to re, um, reseal it? Is that, I'm, I guess my, let me rephrase That's that. from the PCA. Is that typical for a bike, a pedestrian trail to be resealed every five years? Because it's it, obviously different than a street. Yeah. I mean, it would be nice to be able to do that. Um, but I don't believe that it's absolutely necessary. Um, I mean, it's been a number of years already since, since the start of the trail, and it really didn't need sealing until just recently. Um, so I, I'm, that's why, that's the other part of the argument why we don't want to put a five-year lock on it. I guess a, <clears throat> another overall question is, um, would you be able to provide us with, because it's, it's going to come down to dollars, with what does the trail cost the city in a year's time? I mean, if we're doing stream bank maintenance, I mean, what, what is the city's contribution already? Um. Okay, I'll, I'll work on that for next time. Okay, other questions? Jason? No, just uh, so it sounds like in terms of that five years, that's kind of where the confusion came in between the PCA and the city. Yes. Um, it wasn't about providing the maintenance? No. Um, okay. We both agree that, 
the city should provide that maintenance. It's just that uh, five year time. The constriction. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Eileen. No, I just would note, Howard, that the uh, city has what received two grants from the DNR, I think, for a stream bank stabilization. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so we are doing that already in terms of um, look at some other opportunities for maintaining the trail. Yes, um, we we completed the one grant that included work down by Katie's Garden, and the next one will be um, for 2022 um, at different locations further out, further upstream. Okay, Ken, any questions? No questions. Lynn? No questions. Isaac? No questions. I, I do have a question. Um, we have a trail. This is a blacktop trail, right? Correct. And we have a trail at Mountain View Park that's a blacktop trail? Correct. And how often do we reseal that trail? I don't know that it's ever been resealed since it was put in in, what, 98 or 99? <clears throat> How about the trail at Smith Park? Is it that a blacktop trail or a? It's a blacktop trail and that has never been resealed since it was installed in 2008 or nine. Okay, and then do I also recall that we have what would amount to kind of a trail, I guess, that is along Water Street? Correct. Uh, kind of across from where the golf course is? Yes. That, it, is that a, that's a blacktop trail, right? It's not a sidewalk or is it that, a side? There's a, it's a blacktop trail. It extends from Madison Street at the school all the way to the North City Limits built in 2012. Um, that has never been sealed. And same with East Side Road. Oh, yeah. Well, I was trying to remember where they all were. I thought I was doing pretty good. You did very well, yeah. As Adam said, I didn't know those existed. I got them on my list. So. Okay, there we go. <laughs> all right. So Mars brought up some pretty good points. So some of those trails, just based on your dates, we're looking at 12, 13, 14 years old, and we haven't had to see them. And I might not look it, but I do walk those, um, and they seem to be in pretty good shape. So I kind of think that the five-year, you know, time period is going to be pretty um, ex extensive on having to do it every five years in the agreement. So. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to see. Uh, uh, seal coat i guess is what we call it a seal coat plan for all of the trails that we have that are blacktop not not specifically one but i mean we have probably literally miles and i i would and i don't know but i suspect we're putting in another blacktop trail right now yes we are yeah that's what i thought it's going to go from culver's or whatever out to East Side Road. So, I mean, we, we're we getting to have several miles of trails. So we probably do need to think about seal coating and building uh, money into a budget so that we have a seal coating plan or whatever you might want to call it. So I'm, I'm not uh, denying that seal coating might be necessary, but I think we have other places. So if nobody else has any more? I just thought of another question as you were talking, Barb, okay. um, and that is, um, are there other municipalities or other um, trails comparable to ours that you would be able to get feedback in terms of like their repavement or their resealing um, timelines to, to kind of reference? I can, I can look at different ones. I mean, Madison comes immediately to mind that has uh, multiple miles of trails, but uh, I, I know that there are others. I think there are a number in Iowa that uh, do that as well. So I'll take a look. Hey, um, and if anybody has knowledge of another community that has trails like that, by all means, uh, don't be shy about forwarding that information to Howard. It will uh, cut the time he needs to be looking. Okay, I think uh, then uh, we're uh, ready to move that to our action agenda for the next time. And uh, we'll go to the next agenda item, which are council rules. Yes. 
and me. So we were going to have City Manager Intern Bilkey um, do a presentation tonight for the Common Council. That unfortunately is going to be delayed till the twenty fourth. Um, he had an unfortunate incident with his dog that required his attention. So poor guy. Um, so we will have that for you on the 24th, which essentially will be kind of a presentation where he was tasked with looking at uh, some other municipalities example of their council rules. So just kind of looking at how the rest of the year shape out, shapes out, we have about nine uh, roughly official common council meetings left, crazy to think about. Um, so what I would like to do is start really digging into some of the individual rules that uh, have been up for discussion or proposal. So tonight, what I would like us to focus on is rule number one, um, which specifically talks about kind of a, a couple of different things. So one of the things to remember, obviously, with the council rules is in our current uh, ordinance, the way it stands, is the following rules of order and procedure shall govern the deliberation and meetings of the common council and of the committees thereof. So that basically is every single committee that we have um, for the city. So one of the things that we obviously need to discuss when you're thinking about these rules is they not only impact obviously the common council, but they impact all of the other uh, various committees, boards and commissions that we have. So rule number one currently states the following, that following a regular city election, the council shall meet on the third Tuesday in April for the purpose of organization. Regular meetings of the council shall be held on the second Tuesday and fourth Tuesday of each calendar month at the hour of 7 p.m. Any regular meeting falling upon a legal holiday shall be held on the next following secular day at the same hour and place unless changed by a majority vote of the members elect of the common council. And all meetings of the council, including special and adjourned meetings, shall be held in the municipal building unless changed by a majority vote of the members elect of the common council for any specific meeting. So some of the, I guess, deliberation or questions I would like the, to get from the council members tonight is number one would be potential changes would be the 7 p.m. start time. Um, obviously, there's been some discussion about, you know, would there be considerations changing it to 6 p.m. or 6.30, 7? I don't think you want to go later. Uh, I would recommend that we don't. <laughs> but that, I guess, is an option for the council if you want to consider that. Um, so I guess that would be the first question that I have is, I guess, for the council is in regards to the 7 p.m. start time. Um, do you feel that that still is a good time to have meetings? Is there enough um, discussion to think about going to a different time? I guess that's one of the things I'm looking back for feedback first. So let's start there. <laughs> hey, that's where we're going to start. 7 p.m. is good for me, but... I'm an advocate I... for moving it up. Um, <coughs> a couple of reasons. Um, the... Um, I, I just have a concern that sometimes the meetings go late and at the end of a meeting we have a closed session, <coughs> excuse me, or a work session where we have a consultant come in. It gets late and then the consultant has to go home um, and I think by moving it up, <coughs> excuse me, we may have possible better attendance from the community. I agree with Kathy. I'd, I'd prefer to move it up to at least six o'clock. Um, you know, as she has stated, some of these meetings can get on to, as we've seen in the past, it's been 10, 30, 11, sometimes. <laughs> Attendance, if that would make a difference going to six or not, but that doesn't ever hurt to try. So I'd be in favor of moving up to six o'clock. The only concern that I have about six o'clock is I know right now, Sometimes we have like a work session or a special meeting at six before the seven o'clock meeting. And I just don't know, like if we decided to do that, that would push it back to five. And I don't know, that could be kind of tight sometimes in, in those working. situations. But overall, um, I'd be okay with the, the 6 p.m. start time. I was just enjoying the seven o'clock start, start time, guys. <laughs> But I, I could see the logic in doing it at 6 o'clock. Um, so, yeah, I, I would be in favor for moving it up to 6 o'clock. 6 or 7 really doesn't make any difference to me. I can work with either one, 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock. Um, there are some other meetings at 6 p.m. or close to it. So, But that would be something minor. You mean other meetings that it conflicts with or 
Well, do you come from one and have to go to another one at six? Oh, I see. So meetings earlier in the in the time period that you would go no. to. Okay, as long as it doesn't, I I have a concern that it might. I mean, and and uh, Jason, you probably have uh, allayed my concern. I don't want us to unknowingly uh, prevent folks who who may have families from being at a, being on council. In other words, if I'm a mom and I have to make dinner and get my kids organized and you know there's I just don't want us to unwittingly um, exclude someone based on a six o'clock start time versus perhaps a little bit later and maybe maybe that's just my concern and maybe that's just how my household but you know people who have kids if we want to attract those folks to the council, then part of attracting people to the council is having, I mean, you don't want to exclude people based on start time. We're already excluding anybody who can't come on Tuesday. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I guess uh, you can speed back there. Okay. okay. So then the next one obviously is um, since again, that this rule kind of obviously governs all of the commissions and committees Well, not all committees, boards and task force meetings are held in the council chambers. Um, so that obviously is something that I would advocate that we do need to change and put in there that, you know, meetings should occur in the council chambers unless the actual committee determines, you know, a meeting place. Um, so I think that's an easy kind of no brainer change, but unless there's any objection to that. But but should we at least say it should be in a city facility? Yes, I think yes. It needs to take place in the city. I mean, mm -hmm. I correct. To, yeah. it, but even a city facility that would allow right. the police, police department. Fire. Yep. That would allow the Broski. That would allow right. a Library. park. A lot of options. The library, mm -hmm. but I think we probably should say in a city, city facility. facility. Yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the last one to kind of talk about is obviously. Um, Consideration to allow committees, boards, and task force meetings to occur via a virtual platform. So obviously right now, um, you know, the question for the council is, are you open to allowing these meetings to occur via Zoom or another platform? Currently, the municipal code requires all meetings to occur in person. Um, obviously, you know, with COVID-19 and with pandemics, we learned that that not necessarily is an option. So with our declaration of emergency, that allowed the city to obviously in an emergency situation, hold meetings outside of what is in the norm. Uh, but currently in our municipal code, it does indicate that all meetings need to be held in person. Um, so I know we have staff have gotten some feedback from committee members who definitely expressed their appreciation for being able to attend via Zoom. Um, so that is something obviously that uh, we wanna pass along to you. But so with that will come as we get into further rules, if you were to allow that, will be a further conversation about quorum um, because that's the ultimate question is, you know, what constitutes a quorum? Are you gonna consider that to be, you physically have to be present in order to have that quorum? And that way, you know, for instance, for the council, you're seven members. So a quorum, you have to have four. Now, the question is, do you care if that's a combination of you've got three members that are in attendance here within city hall and four of you are on Zoom, or do you want to you know, eliminate that to have only be um, under certain circumstances? So for instance, as an example, um, I know the city of Waukesha um, has a policy where they do allow council members to attend via Zoom, but you get twice per year. <laughs> um, so they put a limit on specifically the meetings. Um, other places have basically kind of gone to, they don't, they're allowing it. Um, that's obviously some technology upgrades that we've talked about that are coming down uh, for consideration that we would have to look into. Um, as we know, it's a little complicated sometimes to be able to hear uh, individuals when they're Zooming in person, so that would require some hybrid technology changes. Um, but that's something kind of up for discussion is, you know, you can definitely as a council say, you know, for certain meetings, whether it be the Common Council or the Planning Commission, you would require those to definitely be in person only. Um, but for some of the other ones, you have no, you know, you would allow it. 
Um, I know definitely it, it is a recruiting tool. So as you know, kind of Council President Doss indicated, for those individuals that um, do have family needs or you know, say they're caring for a loved one or, or under those circumstances or any other unforeseen circumstance, um, it would give them the ability to participate in, you know, in their city. So I think it's definitely something we want to consider. Uh, so that's kind of the question of feedback on where, as a council, you stand on that. Okay. Isaac, we'll start at your end. Um, I, to me, I guess it would, you know, it would kind of be up to, the, you know, for the committees and boards, up to them. Um, as for the council, I feel they should be in person. So, I mean, okay. that's kind of how I feel. I think the council that's fine. should be here. Yep. So, I mean, yep. Lynn. Well, hmm. barring any um, circumstances, like um, you noted, I do believe that the council should make the effort to be in person. Um, there should be um, an area, a gray area, where if it happens um, that you need to be virtual, that we, sh you know, are allowed that probably more than two times since we meet <laughs> twice a month. But yeah, I think it just shows more. Um, it just gives more of us the strength and unity to see people sitting together. So, yeah, I agree with that. And I believe the council should uh, meet in person. And I also believe that other committees, the other committees and so forth, boards, that they can meet via Zoom. That may be very helpful to them. But the council, I think, needs to meet as a group. I think it's very important as far as functioning of the council. We've gone through the use of Zoom, and sometimes it's, in my opinion, been good, and sometimes we have not had good, uh, good, uh, what should I say, good voice. You don't know who's speaking sometimes, and we've, we've had issues with Zoom. So I don't think I want to have council by Zoom. I mean, I would agree, um, at least initially, to put in maybe twice that you could zoom in or some other pending if you simply couldn't make it or something else came up. Uh, assuming we have better technology because otherwise it's going to be extremely difficult. And so I think it's worth trying, at least right. having the option. But generally, I would be in favor of in-person meetings. For boards, commissions, and committees, too? No, I don't know about the boards, commissions, and committees at this point because I honestly don't know how many people really would be interested in doing that. And again, if, if we limit the number of times per year that you can do it, I think I mean, certainly there are other boards and committees and commissions in, the, in Grant County that do that. So it would be the first, we wouldn't be the first to try it. I'm for council meetings being in person, but I'd also entertain discussion of um, some exceptions. You know, what number that is, I don't know, but I think that would be a good discussion to have. Um, I'd be interested to, you know, if um, committees, commissions could provide feedback in terms of like format their members um, would appreciate or, or just kind of get some more information from them specifically. I think that would be nice as well because I would want them to, to kind of operate in the best um, interest of their I also believe the City Council should meet in person but I do like the maybe having that option of twice a year to be able to uh, tune in virtually I mean it's times when life happens and there could be a critical vote or something that's that's needed. Um, and as far as the committees, commissions, boards, and task force, um, I think the experience that we had this last year, uh, year and a half, um, I think it's it's kind of a double-edged sword for convenience. Yes, there's there's um, there's a benefit. I also believe in the benefit of a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, so maybe possibly 
a combination of the same thing. Sure. So the expectation is, is that there is a meeting <clears throat> of each of the committees and commissions, and the boards, task force, whatever, in a municipal facility. And as a committee member, you have X number of times that you can you can do it virtually because I could see for convenience yeah, it'd be pretty nice to be sitting home in your little home office and everybody else consistently makes the effort to go to the meeting. I just, I just think some things are lost. I agree with Kathy. I think, first of all, I think uh, the council needs to meet in person. I, and, and frankly, I think most of the board's commissions and committees need to meet in person more often than they meet virtually. Uh, I do believe that you know we we uh, struggled through and made it through an unusual year, and I think we should be proud that that was that we were able to do that. Uh, it wasn't always pretty, but <laughs> we got it done. Uh, but I and, but I do think it just like our meeting together, a committee or a commission that meets together. I mean, you know, I can't imagine having the discussion we had at Water and Sewer tonight if it was, you know, all, everybody is virtual or half the people are virtual and you can't really hear. So, yeah, I, I would agree that maybe any rule of uh, a couple of times, unless, unless some committee comes before us and, and uh, sure. has a, a compelling argument of why their meeting virtually all the time is in the best interest of everyone. And I guess we can, you know, yep. somebody can try to make that We'll argument. garner that feedback. Right. Somebody can try to make that argument. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah, if I could go back to the timing of the meeting, I was just doing, looking up some other cities that are somewhat similar to us. Um, the majority of my I had found is did 630. Superior, Monroe, Whitewater, Waukesha, they're all 630. La Crosse is a 6 o'clock, but... Majority of them I've seen have been 6:30. That's what I was finding. So, all right. Well, we will keep going. Kind of that's going to be the game plan now for the next couple of meetings. We'll tackle one specific rule, um, and then our plan next week or next meeting is to have uh, City Engine Turn uh, Bilkey present. Uh, kind of similar to what Isaac said. He's found some things, and it's the good, the bad, and the ugly of what he found in other municipalities. And we'll keep going at this with the plan that uh, at our December meeting. We'll have this then as an action item um, to basically be implemented as uh, an ordinance change. So, I have a keep question. Going. Yes. What about um, the present pandemic? What are we going to say, or what's going to be said as far as who's vaccinated, vaccinated, and who's not vaccinated? Is that something that's better for a council, a group of council members? We don't know who's vaccinated. And who's unvaccinated and who can be together yes so that is something so, that so are, are you addressing that so i will tell you starting tomorrow that both myself and administration director maurer are going to the wisconsin city manager association's conference and that is one of the many topics that we will be discussing to find out um what other municipalities are doing how they've been doing it what are the best practices and our intention then is to bring that information back and provide that to you as a council so we can start uh, having those discussions and debates because that may influence how many people want to go on zoom right mm -hmm. versus say a number of council people yeah well, and I think if any, if we've learned anything in 2020, it's that flexibility and needing to make change is is key, right? Uh, what what happens today may not happen tomorrow. Right. <laughs> right. We we saw that pretty quickly in in the past year. So. Um, yes, we all learned how to tap dance without even knowing we could. So, right. But we are in a, basically in a pandemic, even though we may not accept it. And so that's my concern because um, I don't want to be exposed to people that are not vaccinated. Thank you. 
All right, uh, council rules then, we'll see those every uh, week until we plow through them. So <laughs> let us then go on to the next uh, information and discussion item, which is the flag raising policy. Yes, so this is being brought back to the council after a couple of months of the uh, Task Force for Inclusivity, Diversity, and Equity having a chance to look at it. Um, if you remember, this was kind of uh, requested to be sent to that committee to be reviewed. Uh, so we've had a couple of instances um, in the past, and obviously uh, one since I've been here as the city manager, um, in regards to organizations requesting for a flag to be flown in some form or fashion. Um, and out of that came kind of the question as to what has been the policy. And there really wasn't a policy in place. Typically uh, what was done previously is those recommendations would go in front of the council, either in some form of a resolution or pledge or approval process. Um, so it was asked for kind of city staff to look into creating uh, what could be potentially a policy. And that was reviewed by the um, you know, Task Force for Inclusivity, Diversity, and Equity. And what I can tell you is uh, it was a very good discussion uh, out of the couple of months that we had. A lot of the concerns that were brought up by the council um, the last time this was discussed uh, was definitely reiterated and discussed by um, the TIE group as well in regards to, you know, what are the parameters, what procedures do you put in place, um, when do you draw the line on what is acceptable, what isn't. Uh, so the overall discussion that kind of came out of TIDE or the recommendation was that um, although this is obviously something that uh, will have to be continued to be kind of vetted and um, kind of discussed and seen as it goes throughout the process, uh, it definitely was recommended to create a policy. Um, so what you have in front of you obviously is kind of the draft version of the policy. And one of the changes that came out of the um, task force was to actually have a raising of a flag tied to an actual event that is occurring in the city um, and that it would also have to be sponsored by either an organization or um, it be an organization that is you know particularly within our community that has a benefit to the community so uh, it's either particularly tied to an event that is occurring either at the university or uh, particularly, you know, for instance, uh, you know, the Pride event, I think, is an example. There were other events that have occurred um, that potentially could have some you know, flag or, or, or resemblance. Um, and the process would be it would be an application that would be handled by city staff. And then obviously, if there was a question as to, um, you know, or a debate into regards to appropriateness, uh, that then certainly would be brought to the Common Council for your consideration. But at first glance, it would be like the majority of our policies. It would be handled internally by city staff and kind of reviewed um, for appropriateness and determination. And then if there was anything that was kind of a gray area or something that we felt would definitely need some further dialogue or consideration from the community, um, it then would be brought as a formal request to the Council for consideration. So. Um, I guess if you have any questions, I'll kind of answer those, but the policy hasn't changed too much except for the tweaks that, um, two tweaks that they made were particularly to have it be tied to an organizational event that benefits the community. And then it either had to be an organization or it had, they had to get an official um, sponsorship from a recognized organization in the community, so. Okay, questions on uh, the policy that's been proposed Proposed uh, through our tide committee. Kathy, any questions? Yeah, um, a couple things. The tying it, and by the way, thank you to the uh, tide group for working on this because I think I was one of the first ones that brought this up. The fact that we did not have a policy. Um, I'm. To me, it, it's, um, I'm questioning the concept of tying it to a community event um, to raise a flag because we, um, we have a banner that is used by organizations across Water Street for events. Um, and I guess, <clears throat> um, Maybe, maybe I, I would like to maybe just explore that further that if we're gonna tie it to an event, it'd be a banner and not a flag. Um, and then <clears throat> overall, I'm, I am just a little concerned that um, maybe it's not definitive enough as far as, um, 
I still ha I, I still have a concern that the city council is going to be put in a position to have them have to make a determination of whether or not something is appropriate um, because um, I get the, the that part C mm -hmm. um, as far as the don't want anything to negatively reflect the city's image and it's but if someone <clears throat> then I'll just use an example if someone would from the community that would be representing the 501c3 would come to the council and say I want to put up a confederate flag because we have a Labor Day picnic celebrating the confederacy I mean I'm just throwing that out there that will come here how do we deal with that I mean do we want to even get that to a point where it has to come to the council. I guess I, I'm just, I would like to see if there can be maybe some stricter wording as far as um, I don't know. I've, I've thought about this a lot. We don't want to exclude, the whole intent is to be open to all groups and um, reflect a positive for the community, but with this wording, it's, I still see opportunities where, instances where it may come to the council and the council's gonna get caught going, oh, this, is, this could be offensive to some other group or not, so. Jason. Um, in regards to that, I'm trying to remember in our discussion if we had um, put anything in in terms of the tide group also being um, like part of the process of looking at applications. I'm I can't remember for sure if we had added that, but maybe that could be like a, a, a step yep. before it gets to the council. So then the council gets feedback from that committee. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly something that I know came up in the conversations, and obviously that's up to the purview of the council, is you obviously, as the elected officials, have the right if you want to keep it, I guess, in-house, for a better lack of term, or as just as you indicated, Jason, if you want that vetting process, um, that certainly is something that I think would be well-founded and would make sense to have another committee, you know, it would go through staff. If staff has a concern where it's, uh, it's kind of Kathy's point, where, I mean, we can write every policy we want, we're, we're gonna miss something, it's, that's just reality. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is gonna be, you know, when we get those issues, how, what is the best way to address that? And I think it would be, it starts with staff, we look at it and go, this is one that's hidden that, it's just, it's got that line that we're questioning, and then it would go through the proper process of, you know, starting with the tie committee, the tie committee would just like this, make a formal recommendation to the council, um, and then it would go up to the council. Just again, that's another public process. You know, we're a government. We want to get as much public input as possible. That could be multiple meetings with committees um, and then eventually get to the council. So it gives multiple opportunity for everybody to voice their concerns, either for, against, or otherwise. Thanks. Abby. Um, yes, there are so many um, categories or not levels. Levels of um, review. Director of Public Works, City Clerk are responsible for administration. Public Works, are responsible for physical raising and lowering. Common Council, City Manager, Director of Public Works, Clerk have authority. The City Manager will be responsible for the authorization of any revisions to this policy. So I think we've just about covered everything I could possibly think of. Now, I said that. <laughs> <clears throat> um, the uh, statement under the city clerk and director of public works have the authority to determine the eligibility and then C, I think you could take the first sentence off. The city of Platteville will refuse an application to raise the flag of a group or organization has the city has the right to reject an organization group's flag, which I think sure. that covers it. Covers it. The first sentence is really not necessary. I mean, obviously we wouldn't want to have flags that would upset people. Um, in the city, so yeah. Other than that, I I think it's a start. Mm -hmm. 
and we'll learn whether or not it's uh, right. adequate. Mm -hmm. Ken. Okay, I have a few points. I, I want clarification. And um, <clears throat> I'll go to uh, the policy overview. My first question is clarification. The purpose of this policy is to provide, I thought the word the guidelines and regulations for authorization of requests for community organization and special event flag raisings. And I assume that there is already the national and municipal flag standards. Are those already present? They are, but to my understanding, I don't think we have anything that officially outlines that in a policy. So, so, but you have right up for national. Right. But not for the local. Okay, so that was my question is, is this new or already present? And then the next one is down under policy AD. It says submit the request for a flag raising a minimum of two weeks in advance. Then when I go to the form, under note, it says application must be received at least four weeks in advance. So is there a conflict there? No, I was just checking to see if you actually read it. <laughs> good man. That's my test. So good catch. <laughs> okay, and then let's see. Then going to the form itself. Um, the first thing there is that, in parentheses, I have read the criteria, and um, who is I? It's completing it. Yeah, that would be whoever is submitting the application. So there's only one person submitting it? Yes. Okay. And I, my recommendation is that I have read the criteria and believe that my application will qualify. Sure. Versus saying I agree. agree. We can make that change. And then going down, um, I go down to uh, first name. Whose first name is that? Is that the person that is I? Yes. Okay, I'd move that up closer to the I. And also the last name closer to the I. And then the email address, is that I? Yes. Okay, if we move those things up close to I, and then you start naming organization and uh, endorsing organization. Sure. And also the phone, who's that phone for? So that'd be the same thing, we'd move that up. <laughs> okay, that's all for now. Okay, Lynn. Um worked on this policy, I um, did think we, it was a, was a four week, was it four weeks we talked about? Okay. Yep. Um, and there was something in that Eileen said that, start listening to Ken, got to start taking notes with you guys for speaking fast. Um, I think what we were looking at or what the concern was, was that there would be almost a policy where if it represented what the city, that's what I was going to say. So if it came to a point where the city could vouch for it to, in our eyes, it would be valid enough for um, whatever, flag banner, whatever, whatever type of representation. I think the concern is that, um, and I, I totally agree with we should have like a, um, two or three fold ladder. The city says it and then Ty backed it up and the council said we do need um, accountability from everyone but if it's something that already the city is um, agrees with, I know the city, well I would hope the city would not agree to something that um, you know, because they're having a picnic on Labor Day that then they can get a flag um, and it's something that does not um, typify what the personality of Platteville is. You know what I'm saying? So I think that um, when we were, we were flushing this out, uh, a lot of that dialogue was really more of us being real sensitive about how you word it. Um, and then um, 
Yeah. So I so according to what you were saying, Elaine, I I, t- I agree with you. I think there needs to be um, a consideration of that and what Adam said. Well, we're talking about the um, accountability on um, all levels. If everybody can, if it goes from one, if the citizen brings it in and they want to have an event and the city thinks it's um, not uh, beneficial right off the bat, they won't let it happen. But if they are questioning it, then we go to policies that were created by and agreed upon by both um, Ty and the council. I think that's really good. So that that's where I'm standing with this. Isaac. Just a couple of questions here. So on the bottom of the, uh, the first page there, Adam, I just want to make sure I'm reading this right that the United States flag and the Wisconsin flag will always be up no matter whether we have the third one or not. Right. Correct. Mm-hmm. And then looking through here, I guess I really, maybe it's in a different section, but are we going to have a size limit on what the third flag can be? You know, because obviously we're not going to want to have a third flag find larger than what the other two are there. So. Right. So my understanding is it has to be, and I would guess I'll defer to Howard fit. on this one, it has to fit the actual the dimensions problem. of, it can't be any bigger than a normal flag. You know, uh, I th- I think it actually can't be as big as the American flag. I think if you look at the Wisconsin state flag, it's smaller than the American That's flag, yeah. and so yeah. I would think that it couldn't be. Uh, Isaac, my and I don't want to interrupt you, so go ahead and. No, that's what I was going to say. That's my understanding as well is that it can't be right. those. So I make sure that um, it's probably something we should put in either the application or in this policy because sure the majority of us would understand that, but somebody might be coming up think yeah, they coming up, and now you're saying I can't. So sure. So I was going to also say something about size, but then I also, uh, you say, I, I guess in some, ki- in some way, I would like this to be a recognized flag. Mm-hmm. In other words, you know, we're going to have the Dawes family reunion and I take a three by five. We have a, you know, it's not offensive, well, right. but it's not really a flag, you know. So uh, I think it should be, I think these flags should be from recognized flags that are professional flags. I mean. Right, yeah, the conversation that came out of the Tide Committee was to look at obviously, you know, working with our communications staff, (laughs) who's sitting over there, (laughs) Um, to have it be, you know, definitely, it's something, especially if we're tying it to an event, to have it be recognized on either the Facebook page or on our website that it would be, hey, you know, here's the event, here's what's going on, this is why you maybe have you noticed this flag is up for you know this point in time. So I think that we would definitely be looking to tie that into just to the point you indicated. Okay, time limitation. Are we talking about a day? Are we talking about a week? Are we talking about a month? Did Tide talk about how long these flags might fly? I think that's a I didn't see it in there, but it might be. I, I thought I read a month. Did yeah, they have a, they can be a maximum of a month. month. Which I think yeah. is okay. long. Yep. And Which I think is too year. long. And once per calendar year. Correct. I think uh, the, the month thing probably came from the United Nations flag. I think we used to fly that yes. the entire month of October. Uh, I was mean, the for years. pride flag flew in the whole month, too? Yep. Okay. Pri- okay. So, uh, so. Uh, um, a professional flag, uh, and then in here again, and it might be in here, and I might just have missed it. It's one thing to request my flag be flown, but it's another for me to deliver my flag to you. I don't want any. I, I don't want people to believe that the city correct is going to stand the cost of flags. <laughs> okay, so yep. And I, I mean, just like uh, the size limitation or the size requirement, uh, there also should be something in that you have to provide the flag and it has to be provided by whenever or whatever so that you know that. Sure. Okay? Sounds good. Anything else? Then I don't think this one is ready for action next time. If you're gonna bring- Nope, I'll make the changes and we'll bring it back as information in the discussion. Okay, okay. Uh, that concludes this agenda item, and we'll move on to uh, the last agenda item, which is the residential development project potential. And so, Adam? Yep, I'll be kicking that off. 
Um, so obviously within the thoughtful development and prosperous economy section of the city of Platteville's 2021 to 2023 strategic plan uh, lies the goal of seeking a partnership with a private developer to result in a new single family housing subdivision. Uh, so city staff and the common council have been reviewing with developer Michael, Michael Osterholtz, a residential development potential located within the Golden Heights Estates subdivision of the city of Platteville. Uh, currently off Pioneer Road is a platted addition which accounts for 18 single family lots to be created. Uh, Michael Olsterholtz has proposed replotting that area and creating a subdivision that would encompass 12 single family homes ranging from two larger lots and 10 smaller single family lots between roughly 8,000 and 8,100 8, square feet each. The subdivision then would also have a pocket neighborhood which would potentially house a total of 34 pocket style homes. Michael Olsterholtz is in attendance. I see him over there. Um, during the meeting in which he will be providing a presentation to the council as well as the public regarding the proposed project. Um, so in vetting this potential further, Delta 3 Engineering provided the city of Platteville with an estimate of the cost necessary to complete the infrastructure required for this project. It is estimated the addition of Pioneer Road, which would include the addition of water, sewer, and storm lines, would cost roughly $900,000 and the addition of Ready Drive, which would include the addition of water, sewer, and storm lines, would cost roughly $450,000. So this would equate to a total infrastructure cost of $1,350,000. Um, in the past, the city of Platteville has subsidized a portion of infrastructure costs for private development or residential subdivisions to spur growth. Uh, Director Carroll indicated around 2004, a residential subdivision infrastructure subsidy plan was put into place by the city of Platteville. So roughly $600,000 was utilized to assist various developments with this initiative. Uh, so below are examples of previous developments which provide examples of subsidized assistance from the city of Platteville. So there was the Fox Ridge Development LLC was approved via resolution in 2005 to reimburse the developer 25% of the infrastructure costs incurred by the developer for improvements within the subdivision. Uh, there was also Prairie View Subdivisions Finance Agreement was approved by the Common Council in 2006 to award up to about $104,500 under the city's housing investment program with the understanding the developer could return and request up to 25% if additional funds were available. And there was also the Oak Haven Residential Subdivision Infrastructure Subsidy Agreement was another project where the developer was able to receive a total of 25% reimbursement of the infrastructure costs incurred. Uh, so just a quick kind of budget and financial impact, a 25% reimbursement on 1,350,000 would equate to a total of $337,500. Uh, so city staff would recommend considering this to be a baseline for any financial agreement and consider allowing an escalator in the reimbursement percentage if the developer reaches certain performance goals within the development to assist in spring growth within the city of Platteville. Um, so right now the Common Council has authorized the city staff to work with the city attorney on the creation of a draft financial agreement to be reviewed further. Uh, so that currently the city attorney is in the process of creating a draft financial agreement and the attention will be for the Common Council, city staff and the developer to have an opportunity to review the draft document when it becomes available. Uh, the city staff would then encourage council members to review the proposed finance agreement and send any proposed changes, alterations to myself. Uh, the intention would be to have this item back on the agenda at the Tuesday, August 24th common council meeting for potential council action if council members would choose to do so. Um, again, there would be consideration to obviously delay that just so again, the public has a chance to look at that, but that's obviously up to the council. Um, so what city staff would be looking for is recommending entering into some form of a finance agreement with the developer. This would require the developer to enter into a development agreement, which would be brought back to the common council for official authorization and approval. Um, so I will pitch it over to Mike or I'll keep talking if he needs me to, uh, I'll keep going. Okay. So I guess any questions, <laughs> any questions on that while he's trying to do it? So obviously this has been, um, you know, something that we have been working with with staff and obviously as the council as well. Uh, so just any questions I can answer before we turn it over to Mike to give him the ability to uh, give his presentation. Well, you're gonna have an agreement to the council by what time? So the plan is to have that to the council, um, obviously by next week for you to review it. 
Uh, and then it also would be included in the packet on the 24th as our goal. So we are working with the attorney to have that drafted. Um, we hope to have that done by the end of this week. And then that will allow an opportunity next week for uh, myself and obviously Mike to sit down and kind of go over that agreement with the attorney, answer any questions. And then as soon as that agreement is created, I will be sending that to the council for your review. And then obviously we would have that available for the public to look at at the 24th uh, meeting for the first time. Yes. Well, the twenty-five percent one, you know, seemed to work in the past. Um, and it went over pretty well, so I'd be pretty much in favor of sticking with the twenty-five percent that we've done in the future, or excuse me, in the past. Um, as for the plans itself, I know they haven't really changed much, but I'd still like to see some more detail on. I guess was considered the pocket neighborhood. You know, we keep hearing that the lots are going to be five feet from each side of the home or whatever. But I'd like to see some lot lines, you know, where the sure. size is going to be, not just, you know, they could be here or here because, you know, it could determine whether there's 34 houses or there's 30. Um, you know, that may change my opinion on if we should go up to 30% or right there. But, you know, based on just base information that we're given, I'm pretty set on staying at the 25 baseline percentage that we're at here. So, um, you know, I think we could take, I know we keep discussing it kind of like a pocket neighborhood or pocket homes, but, but I think we can start removing that phrase from these discussions because that's not really what we're doing here. So, sure. um, we're kind of just basically creating a planned unit development so we can get rid of some of these other standards that we have. So. Adam, I'm assuming that you will also bring forth um, if if uh, some information about the amount of money we might have for developers. I don't ever believe that we said we would only enter into agreements with one developer. No. So, I mean, essentially, this oh. is something to look at as this would be um, as we consider, you know, as part of the strategic plan. We've talked about entering into multiple kind of developments so that would, would spur partnerships. So this is right. partnerships, correct? <laughs> so I guess toward that goal of partnerships, perhaps with multiple developers, um, as a council, we need to have an understanding of not only the um, output, right, but the input, correct? Because there's the these are not tiffs or anything like that. And uh, maybe uh, Joe or, or uh, Howard could enlighten us, or maybe uh, Eileen or Ken could enlighten us about the roughly $600,000 that was used previously and how that money was, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say assembled. Yeah, procured. <laughs> Okay, Mike, I think you're on. I think you first introduce yourself on the. Is this on? All right. Uh, Michael Ostrolds. Do I have to give my address too? Yeah. All right, 295 Bailey Avenue here in Platteville. Uh, fig figures that I come on a night that you guys talk about not staying too late and doing Zoom meetings with technology. And here we are going too late and technology isn't working. So that's great. Um, Sorry. <laughs> to, uh, before we even get started into, I guess, the presentation, um, Adam, I think you covered everything fairly well. You haven't seen the agreement come back? Not yet, no. Okay. So I'll be following up to see when we get that. Okay. Um, as far as, um, just to touch on Isaac's comment really quick, um, we really haven't had a, a full discussion. We've talked about generalities as far as percentages goes from a reimbursement standpoint. Um, I guess I was unaware that anybody had any criteria they're looking at for more uh, uh, higher density versus lower density as far as what they're looking for reimbursement or anything else from a generality of the pocket neighborhood standpoint, whether it was actually considered a pocket neighborhood, condos, et cetera. The whole goal behind this is to add more housing to Platteville and make it affordable housing for Platteville, which seems to be a, a requirement that the city has uh, stated that it needs in the past through its own uh, 2019 uh, real estate home study that it has done, talking to local real estate agents and just using common sense, looking at all the real estate science that go up and down with inside the community. 
So uh, without my lovely PowerPoint presentation here, uh, I'm just going to try to wing it. Um, if that comes up, that would be great. Uh, well, last time we did a closed session, I think we did five or six of these. Uh, last time we talked, I said I'd try to keep it under 20 minutes for you guys. And most of this will be review for the council and most of the staff. For you, a uh, few folks that are sitting in the audience, this will be uh, new information, I guess. Um, Adam, since you kind of did the summary, I'm going to skip over a bunch of stuff and just kind of sure. hit on certain sections of it. Again, this is uh, the discussion of the Golden Heights development. Uh, for everybody, if you don't know where that is, it's kind of out by where the Free East Church is over there off of Pioneer Road and Ready Drive, uh, more or less on the south end of town that butts right up to the uh, city limits, more or less. Uh, this original, uh, original project was started in the late 80s, uh, going up Pioneer Road and Pyrite Road. Um, it was a project that was done through ONS Investments, primarily through East McCartwright, which my father, Gary Ostrowitz, is one of the members that started it. This is one of the last sections of that that was platted in the mid-90s. Um, the plat was done for a typical neighborhood of what you would see in the 90s. It was about half-acre lots, uh, planned out on larger, wider streets with the idea of larger homes put on the property. I'm not sure what's coming up, but maybe it is. Um, since that was never done, Gary has since retired, and um, I guess we've turned it over to a new generation. Uh, we're looking to do something with that property. Um, the current use for the property doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense for Platteville's needs. With affordable housing seem to be a buzzword, uh, people clearly needing it. If you look at anything in town, property goes up for sale, it typically goes under contract in like a week unless there's something wrong with it. And we know of plenty of people that have moved to the community recently that have you know, even had issues finding housing, which within the uh, city limits, which has then put them in positions where they have to live or choose to live in the township, um, any one of the satellite communities, or uh, even commute from a larger community, say Dubuque, uh, for numerous reasons, whether it's from a lack of a housing shortage, because uh, Platteville typically tends to have higher property taxes for those means, um, or just lack of general building um, lots that are affordable. Um, a little bit to play on that too it has to do with the higher building costs that we've seen recently uh, due to the pandemic and coming out of it that is settling down a little bit, but um, still something to be taken into consideration. Um, I know we talked about this, we did one of our first meetings way back when it was a Zoom meeting in the spring, I believe. Uh, there is the plat map of the, the new proposed subdivision. Uh, talking a little bit about affordable housing and kind of how we're dictating that. Um, kind of just doing some basic math and I don't have the PowerPoint presentation up. So basically what we're going to consider affordable housing in Platteville is 195 up to 325,000. That's approximately the range of affordable housing in Platteville. Pretty much anything below 190 you can't put up a decent home for. Uh, 320 if you use the average median income of between 55 and $60,000 a year in Platteville will allow you to build or buy a home for approximately that dollar amount. Now I'm not saying that's what we're shooting for. When we had our initial discussions we talked about ceilings and floors. That's kind of the range we're looking to deal with right now. Uh, you look at a lot of the property that's on the market, you can't find anything in that range, but of some of the neighboring communities that I have provided, uh, Ken, I sent you a couple of those emails the other day that have done pocket neighborhoods, tend to be right in that same price range. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, uh, how we're looking to change the neighborhood. Going from the 18 larger lots into what you see up there on the screen, basically what we're gonna to look to do is do some cost saving measures, have everything resurveyed, and then look to skinny some things up. So by uh, removing two of the road outlets that are currently platted in that go to the west and to the south, we're gonna gain some more real estate. We're also gonna skinny the road down, which Howard said would not be a problem. Instead of doing a corner, is now gonna be a gentle curve. Uh, the lots to the north, um, that are, should be labeled 1 through 10 up there uh, are adjacent to the current lots that are in the neighborhood. We're going to uh, make those lots smaller, approximately 70 by 100, so that it provides a smooth transition from the current neighborhood out to what we're looking at doing. Uh, these lots you'd be able to put on a standard size home as they'd be R1 and could be um, anything from ranch style houses to two style homes, uh, two story homes, etc. As we cross, cross the street there, the larger section will be um, basically, I think Adam's called it a, a PUD, but it, it's essentially a PUD. Um, it will be a pocket community. For those that don't know what a pocket community is, it's a, essentially um, smaller home cottages that are closer, uh, a little bit more higher density, that look to drive costs down but still provide nice communities surrounded by green space, walking trails, et cetera. 
a lot of communities, whether it's Madison, Middleton, which are very successful, or smaller communities such as Maquoketa or Grinnell, uh, Iowa, um, have, have done this. Um, it allows to put up more affordable housing, nicer, more tight-knit neighborhoods that tend to be very well kept due to that they have homeowners associations associated with them in most cases. Um, they're also able to be um, a little bit nicer looking than your typical apartment complexes, duplexes, and multifamily type stuff. And they're just as easily to keep um, ADA accessible, which I know is a big deal for Ken. Um, they do appear to a larger demographic. The demographic we're going to look for here, besides anybody that's looking for affordable housing in Platteville, will also be young professionals, since there's a lower barrier to get into the market, and retirees that are looking to downsize. And there's both a demand for those in the market. I've spoken to at least six real estate agents just this week in prepping for this meeting, and that demand has done nothing but get increased. Okay. Um, by doing this, not only are we trying to encourage growth in Platteville, but we're also trying to um, create additional property tax income for the city. I know this is not a TIF district, and we've had extensive conversations of why it is or isn't or can or cannot be a TIF district. The whole goal behind this by looking to uh, get some infrastructure assistance for the infrastructure for the, from the city is that A, we're gonna produce income coming back to the city in the form of property taxes by encouraging people to live within the city limits of Platteville and not outside in the neighboring communities, township, et cetera, um, but also provide something that would be good for the city and good for growth. Just done all that stuff. So kind of uh, closing up here real quick and then I'll open it up to questions. And then I don't know if you got any of those links to work on that email or not. No. Okay, we'll work with that. Okay, so uh, again, just summing up real here and I'll open up to questions. Again, this is the cliff notes of everything you guys have heard already. Um, you know, why looking to do this with us? Well, we're a local developer. Your own strategic plan has that you guys want to partner with a developer to look to bring more housing to Platteville. Uh, why not partner with a local one, especially one that is already involved within the community and has somewhat to do with the original development of the lots, though I may have been much younger. Um, I was, because of Gary, involved with a lot of the Pioneer Road and Pyrite Road development, except for the houses that don't look nice. I had nothing to do with those. Um, we have the property ready and waiting. It's already I platted and ready to go. Um, again, I know Isaac made a comment about seeing how many houses we can get in there. Once we figure out what, um, how to budget ourselves appropriately, looking at how the city looks to work with us, we can then start the surveying of the land and figure out uh, from a topography standpoint, how we want to do things. Our goal is to move as much dirt around as we can to allow for walkout basements, building on slab as necessary to try to keep costs down for some of the homes, yet accommodate some of the needs that people may have as they're looking to purchase. Um, we're not going to know a lot of those things till we get in there. I don't want to bring dirt onto site or move dirt onto site. It's going to be a lot of once we get out there and start uh, getting the surveyors pulling tape and stuff that we'll figure out what's the best plan. Um, this will look to address, hopefully, the affordable housing concerns of Plantville. Again, um, I've had plenty of people look at me, uh, especially looking at the current lumber market and saying, what the hell are you doing? Um, the market has settled down, and this is a project that's going to take 12 to 18 months to just get bids out, get the financing uh, finalized, and get the project started before we'd even start to consider dumping houses in. So we're going to be prepared for that market and then make decisions based on what happens. Um, Finally, we're looking to put skin in the game with this. Um, you know, this is new to the city of Platteville. This has not been done locally before. Uh, most of the current lots we have for sale or subdivisions are more traditional for the city of Platteville. So um, I am sticking my neck out a little bit from a standpoint of I'm gonna be the first one through the brick wall attempting to do this. Uh, that can be good and bad. I believe it will be very good, but I am looking to put my money where my mouth is. So um, it's gonna be something that we're gonna to look to take care of. And uh, by saying that, I'm also gonna to look to keep a lot for myself and live in the community. So if people aren't happy, they'll know where they can come find me. Um, without all my other bells and whistles for you guys, that is basically all I have. And I promised I would not go too long. So Adam, if you have anything else you wanna tie in there, we'll make sure the technology works for the second meeting. You do that. Yeah, and any questions from the council? Okay, questions. Uh, Kathy? Jason? No, I think we've, uh, as you said. <laughs> we've become great friends over this, right? <laughs> Ken? 
No questions at this time. Lynn. No questions at this time. Isaac. No questions this time. Okay, so, so I do have a question, and that would be a timeline question. Okay. So do you have a um, concept, an idea of how you, are, are you suggesting that you would move forward with the entire, what is it, 14, how many acres? You mean how, how quickly would we do it? We'd do it in two phases, as we've discussed in the past. Okay. We'd, we'd do the initial, I think it's called Street A on the plans, which would be the 10 lots to the north and then kind of the first phase of the lots or houses adjoining Street A on, to the south, which we would call Phase 1. Um, that's the majority of the infrastructure that needs to be put in in that phase. The second phase um, of houses that will be to the south, um, as you'll see there is a private drive that has access to that us as the de developer would look to put that private drive in so we would do that on as phase two um, depending on how quickly things go up and how quickly the market moves uh, we'd look to do that way sooner than later and i think those are one of the things that adam and i have talked about in some of the closed sessions as far as incentive behind doing that i mean obviously we want to move as promptly as possible within a reason of providing good work and having a good absorption for the community. But in the same respect, if there is a motivation to get more done quicker, um, you know, we'll definitely look to accommodate that based on you know, w w however we need to accommodate that. But this is not something we're looking at dragging out. Um, you know, when, when Gary did the lots, you know, I think he'd sell whatever he could in a given year and he'd try to do two or three, you know, custom custom homes, if not more that year, maybe one spec home, uh, we're gonna look to, to, to way blow past that. Yeah, that's the intention I think as staff we've talked about is creating the, um, you know, the potential finance agreement to be just as Mike indicated, is there would be a baseline that irregardless if the entire project was completed, it would equate to a certain percentage of reimbursement, but then to spur growth and development, there's the consideration of you know if he was able to get it done within a certain time frame, you know that's up to you guys as a council if you want to improve that type of finance agreement, but essentially it would be an escalator. So there'd be a baseline guarantee of you complete the project, you get X, but if it's completed within two years, four years, et cetera, um, there's the opportunity or more or less the incentive for the developer to move more quickly into completing the project, which at the end of the day is the benefit to the city because that's sooner than that that tax base is hitting the municipality. In just in general market conditions with low interest rates and stuff right now, which we anticipate seeing at least for the foreseeable future, the quicker we can do it, the more attractive this is from an affordable housing standpoint. Any other questions by anyone? Okay, thank you. And yeah. um, ladies, we'll have to figure out this computer thing, huh? I'll come, I'll come earlier next time. Okay. All right. Uh, I look at my agenda and it appears we're at the end, which means I need but one more motion. Second. So I have a motion by Kathy. I, did, I saw Candace didn't see that. And a second by Ken to adjourn. Uh, Candace will vote. Cop? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Shanley? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian. Yes. Motion carries. And thank you all for attending, and uh, have a good evening.